Okay, so quick refresher. This semester has been focusing on Old Testament controversy um, and what the uh, sort of Christian response is to objections related to these contentious issues. Um, and I think we've gone about, I think this is the fourth or fifth week, so I think it's a good time to kind of recap what we've done so far and uh, sort of get our bearings on where we've been and where we're going. So for our first week, um, well, actually our zeroth week, uh, we had Dr. Micah Green give us a very, very broad overview on how to conceptually uh, discuss the Old Testament, especially in relationship with Christian theology. Then our first official week, we talked about the text of the Old Testament, or the Tanakh, uh, or Hebrew Bible. All of these are synonymous. Um, and we talked about uh, the Masoretic text as the primary Hebrew foundation for the text that we have, and the Greek Septuagint is a, another version that's out there. Um, and we also talked about how the text was composed and the inspiration is more of a process and not an event. It's not like God sort of takes over a writer and makes him move like a puppet uh, in order to write down what happens. Uh, there are many hands involved and divine inspiration occurs over uh, many generations. Uh, then the week after that, we started our sort of excursus on this question of evolution and creation. So we started by the, uh, addressing the interpretive questions of the primeval history, which is Genesis 1 through 11. Um, the main takeaways there is that the genre of these 11 chapters are widely considered to be proto-history, which is to say these are historical events and people, but they are cloaked in the mythological language of exalted prose. Another fancy way of saying this is this, uh, the events that are described are uh, not described, the, the, the events that are described are not described in a very clean, neat, uh, sort of line-by-line -line, uh or play-by-play, -play boring description. Um, last week, we started talking about integrating Genesis with science, uh, and here we talked about the various interpretations in the history of Jewish and Christian debates over uh, Genesis, uh, especially with the relationship to the age of the earth. And we discussed that of the myriad of views that are available, only the literal calendar day interpretation is really in any serious conflict with uh, contemporary science regarding the age of the universe. Um, we also talked about the question of common ancestry and how that relates to the interpretation of the kinds of Genesis 1. Uh, and there we discussed that there are about three main views uh, for how to interpret after their kind, and only the fixity of the species interpretation is, in really, is the only one that's in any serious conflict with uh, the idea of common uh, ancestry or common descent. And then we also talked a little bit about uh, the contemporary field of evolutionary science and how Darwinism is, you know, that's a big scary word, um, is actually dead. And it's been dead since like the 1870s. Neo-Darwinism is also dead since like the 1910s. Uh, and the modern synthesis is probably on its way out. It's true, it's fine, it's good, it's just radically incomplete. Uh, and uh, so we talked about some of the newer, more contemporary theories that are on the field that are starting to supplement this idea of random mutation and natural selection. That's what we mean by the modern synthesis. Those uh, causal factors are definitely true, but the contemporary field has kind of agreed, the consensus is that they're insufficient to explain everything. Um, and so for a lot of, and because of that, a lot of the debates about creation and evolution are kind of stuck in the past. They're still debating things that modern scientists have already kind of said, yeah, we're, we, we know that that's insufficient. Um, so that was where we uh, talked about uh, last week. Um, let's see, so now what we're gonna talk about this week is Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Um, and these are the scientific and theological battlegrounds that we talked about. So those first three questions is what we discussed last week. Um, and we left the fourth one off for this week because of the theology. Um, so what, to what degree do these four questions that we have up there integrate with Christian theology? Uh, and the last and last week we kind of said, you know, these first three things, uh, the age of the earth, uh, common descent, uh, mechanisms of biological diversity, they're interesting, they can cause tensions with certain interpretations, but broadly speaking, nobody really loses their marbles over this. Um, it's not that big of a deal theologically. But once you start talking about human beings and you start talking about Adam and Eve, then things start to get really, really, really dicey. This is eight independent, or sorry, these are eight independent doctrinal uh, positions that I thought of just this morning where 
debates over Adam and Eve at some point come up. Probably the big one is this fancy word, I'm probably going to mispronounce, hamartiology. That's a $10 word. The doctrine of sin. Christology, you know, Jesus. Eschatology, the end times. Baptism. I know for a fact that in this room there are at least six different views of baptism and whether babies are involved, and all of us are going to start arguing about Adam and Eve at some point in that debate. Even to, it even reaches into apologetics, and it comes to this idea of theodicy. You know, why is there evil in the world? Why do babies die? That question is literally tied into what you think about Adam and Eve. And of course, the most significant one is anthropology, our doctrine of man. Uh, depending on what you think about Adam and Eve and what you think about these stories and how you interpret them, it's going to radically shape what you think about the human uh, race. I will give you one tangent, because I think this is uh, particularly relevant, which is uh, in the 1800s, or you know, immediately following uh, Darwin's uh, theory of, uh, or his first statement of the theory of evolution, massive uh, debate over um, the sort of moral status of the different races of human beings. I'm sure you've probably heard this before, that there is no, uh, there aren't races of human beings, there's only one human race. Um, in the 1860s, this was a major theological fight where there were many abolitionist Christians that were motivated by their specific belief that all human beings were descended from Adam and Eve, uh, literally in the strongest sense of that term. Because they believed that, they genuinely believed there was no moral difference between uh, black people, white people, or any other race. Um, and because of that, they fought for abolition on that basis of their belief. And many people that were racist and many people that defended slavery used Darwin at the time and said, look, science backs us up. Because Darwin says that there's not one human race, there are actually like five, and wouldn't you know it, the white race is at the top and the negroid race is at the bottom. So actually, we were right all along. It's a very sad chapter in human history. Um, but it, and you'll actually still hear this argument come up a lot, where people say, oh, if you believe evolution, that makes you a racist. It's an interesting tangent. Uh, I'd recommend the book, The Civil War is a Theological Crisis, um, where they discuss this. Truth in advertising, there were some people that were racists, and they were Christians, and they said, well, since I'm a racist, I have to square my racist beliefs with Christianity in some way, and started sort of back interpreting things in text. Uh, because they were running into this question of, well, if everyone descends from Adam and Eve, then how can I still be racist towards black people? And I'm sure you, some of you have heard this idea of the curse of Ham, literally invented by racists looking for something to be racist about because of their belief in Adam and Eve. It's a very interesting theological debate. We're not going to get into it any further than just this comment right here, but I'd recommend that book, The uh, Civil War is a Theological Crisis. Excellent introductory book. Read the footnotes. So... Now, what is our goal tonight? Because if we're not going to talk about all of these, believe me, it will take forever. Um, so let me just give you an example objection of what some people will typically bring up in a conversation about uh, apologetics. So this is a nice you know, uh, scholarly meme that I found. So in four sentences, this is going to refute all of Christianity. Genetics has proven the Adam and Eve story in Genesis to be impossible. Without the Adam and Eve story, there would be no, quote, original sin. Without original sin, there would be no need for Jesus. Without Jesus, the Christian religion falls apart completely. The whole religion is based on and relies upon a story that could not possibly be true. All evidence points to this fact. End game. All right, let's go home. We've all been refuted, right? Now, if you just think about this statement for, like, I don't know, two seconds, how many hidden assumptions are baked into this? I, at least, I can think of at least 10 independent assumptions that are all baked into this. But my favorite one, of course, is genetics has proven, like just genetics. What is genetics, right? It, it's, it's just so, there are so many things to unpack in this. So our goal tonight is not to refute this every single, you know, go down the logical tree of every possible objection. And our goal is not to discuss all the possible variations of Adam and Eve and how they interact with those eight independent Christian doctrines that I talked about. I did the math just before I came up here. That would result in 390,000 independent combinations, dependent, at, at minimum, on a conservative estimation. So our goal is not to go through all of these things. Our goal tonight is just to establish the opening move. It's just to say, here's how we start to respond to this. Here's the lay of the land so we know uh, where we're going and the potential routes that we can take. 
Okay? So with that in mind, here's going to be our roadmap. So first we're going to talk about the biblical data of Adam and Eve. And again, we're going to truncate this to just the most relevant stuff. Then we'll talk about some of the scientific data related to human origins. Again, massively truncating that to just the most relevant, relevant things. And then we're going to start to integrate some of these different models with our theological concerns. All right? Now, major disclaimer here. Every one of those doctrines, depending on your view of Adam and Eve, someone's going to call you a heretic. And we're exploring some possibly heretical views tonight. I am not going to endorse any, but just to put everyone at ease, the official Russia Christie National Incorporated, the people above us, this is their official position uh, regarding this topic. We believe humans were created in the image of God and that in a discrete historical event, Adam and Eve fell from their good relationship with God through sin. And as a consequence of their sin, there is a divine curse on the whole of creation and all descendants of Adam became spiritually dead uh, through having an inherited corrupted nature, Christ alone being the exception. It just occurred to me, I didn't mention the whole creation in my other one, so add uh, a ninth doctrine to that list of eight doctrines, which brings that up to 1.3 million combinations now, I think is about what that is. So, disclaimer. Views expressed today are of the views either of myself, which I will try to hold back uh, and be objective as possible, or of the authors I am citing. They are not necessarily endorsed by Rashi Christie. They are not necessarily endorsed by Central Church, which is where we are today. Those views are independent. At this point, I would like to say my Darwin shirt is, for legal reasons, ironic. I'm not necessarily endorsing this. Okay. <laughs> now then, recommended resource for you. So um, a lot of the material that we've done here and kind of condensed and structured is based actually on uh, this young up-and-coming man, William Lane Craig. He's got a podcast called Defenders, and he has a 35-episode uh excursus on biological diversity, uh, or was it, uh, creation of life and biological diversity. Um, it's a very, very good overview. Highly recommend it. I don't necessarily agree with all of his conclusions, but excellent resource uh, there. And so if you don't see a citation, it's probably uh, coming from this uh, or somewhere, somewhere in there. I try to be good about my sources, but this is primarily what I'm drawing from. Okay, now we're going to talk about the biblical Adam and Eve. But before we do that, we've got to make some very important distinctions here. So the first distinctions are we need to talk about a literary character versus a historical character. We need to talk about truth in a story versus truth simplicator or unqualified truth. And we need to talk about illustrative uses and assertive uses. Okay? All right, so this first one is literary versus historical characters. So basically... Human beings have written a lot of narratives and a lot of stories and created a lot of literary works, and they have characters in them. Some of those characters have reference in the real world. When we talk about a character in a story, we're talking about that character insofar as they inhabit the world of their story. Aragorn, for example, inhabits Middle Earth. Um, when we talk about a historical character, we're actually talking about the flesh and blood human being that actually existed in our world. I think the best way to distinguish between these is a literary character does not have any causal influence on you beyond some like you know, metaphorical, like, oh, I was influenced by Aragorn to be a good person. That, that aside. Um, whereas people in the historical world, they inhabit the same causal realm that we do, if that makes sense. Um, so a couple of examples. Julius Caesar. There's the historical Julius Caesar, first emperor of the Roman Empire. Um, and then there's also the literary Julius Caesar, the character in the Shakespeare play. More contemporary example, there is Alexander Hamilton, the literal, historical, first Treasury Secretary of the United States, and then there is Lin-Manuel Miranda in his musical uh, called Hamilton. So whenever we talk about Hamilton, we need to be clear. We talk about the musical, we talk about the historical person. Whereas Sherlock Holmes, there is no Sherlock Holmes in the real world, but there is a literary Sherlock Holmes. Okay. So that's, that's the distinction. Some are purely literary, some are historical and literary, some are purely historical. Still waiting for someone to write a story about me so I can have a literary version. But one day, one day. Okay. So that's the distinction between literary and historical. Pretty straightforward. Now this next one is truth simplicator, or truth unqualified, versus truth in a story. So unqualified simplicator truth is just, it's true. No qualifications, no notes, no nothing. Whereas true in a story is, 
It's true in that story, but it is not true outside of that story. I think a simple example is uh, with Sherlock Holmes. Where does Sherlock Holmes live? Well, literally in the real world, nowhere, because he doesn't exist. But in the story, he lives at 221B Baker Street. Yeah, uh, with uh, Julius Caesar, you know, it's true in a story that he was visited by the soothsayers, beware the Ides of March. In reality, no, that didn't happen. So if you ask this question, was Julius Caesar approached by the soothsayers to beware the Ides of March? Is that true, or is it false? It is true in a story, it is not true in the real world. Okay, so then the last one is illustrative uses versus assertive uses. So illustrative uses is whenever you employ, this is a third party, some other individual, employs a part of the narrative or a part of the history of a particular individual to make a point. Classic example with Julius Caesar. Well, guys, at this point in our proposal, we've really, uh, we've really crossed the Rubicon. You know, we've reached the point of no return. Uh, that is an il illustrative use of Julius Caesar. Now, I can say that, and it could be the case that Julius Caesar never existed, or more accurately, he only existed within the Shakespeare play, and that statement would still hold water, right? Because we can use illustrations that are false. Trojan horses, for example, or um, Pandora's box, you know, anything from Greek mythology, we use it all the time. Whereas if I'm giving you a history of Rome and say, at the point that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, this was an effective declaration of war on Pompey, or Pompey, I think is how his name is actually pronounced. Um, and at that point, there was no, uh, it was the point of no return. Rome was officially in a civil war. Now, I'm giving you, I'm asserting that Caesar did this. I'm not illustrating that, using it as an illustration point, I'm actually asserting it to be the case. So in the first case, an illustration really just needs that literary character. An assertive needs that historical character. Okay? Clear on that? I think it's pretty straightforward. All right, so now what we're going to do is, as we survey the biblical data on Adam and Eve, our questions are going to be, are we talking about literary Adam, or are we talking about historical Adam? Are we talking about truth in a story? Or are we talking about truth unqualified? Um, are the authors that reference Adam using him illustratively or assertively? Okay? So these are the primary uh, texts where uh, Adam and Eve are referenced in the Bible. We're just going to focus on these because these are the most significant. The first is the literary Adam. So this is the narrative account of Adam and Eve from Genesis 2 through 4. And I'm going to assume a little bit of familiarity on everyone's part uh, with this story. But broadly speaking, uh, God creates this man out of dirt. He breathes in him the breath of life. He names a bunch of animals. He gets lonely. God uh, cuts him in half or takes out a rib. It's kind of not clear. He creates a woman, uh, names him Eve, or sorry, names her Eve. They, uh, they're married. Uh, they uh, rebel against God. They're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They have a bunch of kids, namely Cain and Abel. And then they kind of disappear from the picture for a while. Now, Based on the, so this is actually the, this is what defines the literary Adam. When we say literary Adam, we're talking about this character in Genesis 2 through 4. And a genre analysis of uh, Genesis 1 through 11, again from about two weeks ago, suggests that this account is mytho-history. In other words, it's probably talking about the past, it's probably talking about real events, but it's so cloaked in this sort of uh, mythological language that we really can't be too certain about what the boundary is between literal, straightforward, factual history and sort of, you know, literary license, if you will. Uh, one example that I think makes this point uh, extremely well is the very names Adam and Eve. Adam is itself a Hebrew word meaning man, and Eve is, translations are debated, but it's usually referred to as something like life. So if you read it in English, God created man and life, and you already kind of see that this isn't really like a straightforward story. Uh, and more importantly, those puns, those are Hebrew puns that really only make sense uh, after the fact. Um, like, the Hebrew from about 1000 BC is what you would need in order for these puns to make sense. Uh, so the story itself, if it was actually given to Adam and Eve in the time when they were created, even if you do 4000 BC, it wouldn't have made sense to them. It doesn't make sense in any language except, you know, uh, monarch uh, monarchical uh, Hebrew. So. What is the summary here? So this narrative account is not really clear on its own. Uh, the most we can infer confidently is that we're talking about truth in a story, we're talking about a literary character, um, possibly historical, but nothing in the text itself as it stands really demands anything past that um, in and of itself, okay? So this is the literary Adam. 
Now, the second character is the genealogical Adam. And this is when Adam shows up in genealogies throughout the Bible. And these are, um, there are three of them. So Genesis 5, of course, is uh, where, you know, that's Adam's children. First Chronicles um, 1 recounts uh, the genealogies of Genesis 5 and ties it into uh, the monarchy. And then, of course, Luke 3 references Adam at the very end of, uh, or rather the very beginning of Jesus' own genealogy. So these genealogies include people that are undoubtedly historical, or at least intended to be historical at the very minimum. David, Jesus, Moses, these people are like, these are founding members of uh, Israel's history. And more importantly, the mythological oddities that are in these lists, for example, the really, really long ages, those are not sufficient to say that they're not historical. So the Sumerian king list, as a point of, uh, as an example here, it's a list of all the kings of Sumer. Surprise, right? Uh, and I don't remember exactly when it was written. I think maybe 1500 BC. But it lists these kings as reigning for like literally tens of thousands of years. But if you look at this one king who is, uh, uh, I'm going to mess up the name, uh, Inme Baragesi, is how that's pronounced. This guy reigned for 900 years in, according to the Sumerian king list. But here's a little pot shirt right over here, or an illustration of it. This guy like, was real. Like, he was undoubtedly an actual king. So just saying that, oh, well, obviously he wasn't, oh, sorry. Saying, oh, well, obviously, you know, he lived for 900 years. This is a mythological character. That's not going to cut it, right? So um, what do we have here with these genealogies? Uh, it could be the case that we have Adam is a mythological, a purely mythological character that's then tacked onto a historical genealogy. Or it could be that he's a historical character uh, that is a part of these genealogies and has then been in his story sort of mythologized and kind of dressed up for the purpose of that narrative. Um, personally, I lean towards the view that he was probably historical, that the intent of him being in the genealogies is he was a real person um, and that the literary story has kind of been dressed up in this, in this language. Now, truth in advertising, uh, Sumerian scholars actually debate over the kings prior to Inme Baragesi as to whether or not they were historical. So you can really go either way on this. You can say, since Inme Baragesi is a real person, the kings prior to him are probably real. Or you could say, well, since the people prior to Inme Baragesi aren't real, then we know that we can tack purely mythological uh, people in with real people. It can go either way. I'm just telling you my personal opinion and the general attitude of scholarship is to lean towards people in genealogies are given the benefit of the doubt as being real people like actual historical people. And I think that at least for Genesis 5, 1 Chronicles, and Luke, the benefit of the doubt has been given to Adam as being a historical person. Okay? So that's the genealogical Adam. And the last Adam is, of course, the Pauline Adam. This is the one where everyone gets all their marbles in a wad. So, believe it, first, let me make a meta comment. I just talked about Genesis 2 and 1 Chronicles 1, and that is it. That's all Adam is in the, in the Old Testament. There may be like a handful of odd references, but all of them are debatable. Like that's the only time he's non-controversially in the Old Testament. But he gets way more attention in the New Testament. So uh, Paul talks about him quite a bit, and the three most significant ones are this one, this incidental remark in Acts 17. So for context, Paul is in, uh, where was he? Athens, right? Thank you. Uh, so he's in Athens. He's on Mars Hill. He's arguing with a bunch of pagans. And He's making all these illustrations, he's making a bunch of points, and he's arguing. And then he makes this comment, God made from one every nation of men to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation. Um, now, the majority of interpreters consider this the one to be Adam. Uh, so basically, some translations will render this God made from one man every nation of men. So this is at least an incidental affirmation, at, at my, you know, to my inferences, that Paul definitely believed in the universal descent of humanity from Adam. Um, but in the context, Paul is making a lot of references and allusions to a lot of different uh, sources. In fact, in this very discourse, he references pagan material that he definitely did not think was you know, literal and definitely didn't think that it was inspired. So if he throws in his own Hebrew scriptures as an example, I don't think that we can really infer much more than that this is a primarily an illustrative point 
Um, and for that reason, I don't think we can really assign much more than uh, just the literary atom, at least in this part. It can go either way, but I tend to think that this is an illustrative use. Now, the second passage doesn't quite give us that out. So 1 Corinthians 15, uh, this is Paul's commentary on the resurrection. Excellent passage. And he starts drawing these parallels, very poignant theological parallels between Christ and Adam. For as by one man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last man Adam, that is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Just as we bear the image of the man in dust, uh, we shall also bear the image of the man in heaven. Now, Paul clearly thought that Jesus was a real historical person who really literally exists. So trying to draw these parallels starts to really blur the lines between is it a literary character, Adam, and a historical person, Jesus? Well, the Greek technically allows that because Paul's argument, or the, the Greek here doesn't really say, like, because of one man's sin, uh, therefore uh, Jesus, at least not in this passage. Um, so it could go either way, but think about it for a minute. Like, think about what Paul's argument here is and think, do you, is it really that natural to think that he's using a purely literary character to make his argument? This one, I think, goes on the question mark pile. I could go either way on this one, uh, honestly. But the last passage here, Romans 5, this is where things really get dicey if you're going to say that Adam is just a literary character. Because Paul actually intensifies these Adam-Christ parallels. Uh, and most significantly, he says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Um, for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. At this point, Adam is really starting to be used as a causally relevant agent in the world in which we inhabit. Uh, and at that point, I think this passage at least really pushes past the boundary of the literary Adam, and now we're starting to need more of a, a, a historical Adam uh, at some point. So I think this is the, the single strongest passage to say that Paul at least affirmed a historical Adam. Now, again, truth in advertising. This is my own assessment. This is the assessment of a lot of evangelicals, which, again, that's my tradition. Um, there are many other interpreters who do not agree with that. There are some interpreters who say that Paul's argument doesn't commit you to a historical Adam. My personal assessment? Eh, I don't find them all that persuasive. But, you know, truth in advertising, right? Okay, so let's summarize real quick. Uh, and then uh, after this, we'll uh, 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 stop for comments and questions. So first, we have the narrative account of Genesis 2 through 4 that defines the literary Adam. But the genre that we're talking about, this complicated mytho-proto-history, it really tempers down any strong historical inferences based on just that text alone. But the genealogies of Genesis 5, 1 Corinthians, and Luke, those suggest a historical interest in Adam and seem to assert Adam at least at the genealogical headwaters of all of humanity. And then Paul's incidental treatment in Acts and uh, 1 Corinthians, their most natural interpretation is that he is a historical person um, and that Paul employs him both illustratively and assertively. But Romans 5 really seems to be a direct, positive, assertive argument uh, that Adam is responsible for things in our world that a mere literary character cannot. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, the summary point of, of, of what we're looking at. Now, there are a lot of different models for uh, Adam and Eve um, which we'll talk about in just a second. But let me just pause right here and see if there are any questions or comments. Um, I uh, was wondering if there were any significant differences between the Septuagint version of Adam and the Masoretic text version of Adam. I think he lived for a different period of time. I think his lifespan was different. Oh, I forgot. i got to restate the question. The uh, question was, is there a difference between the Septuagint Adam and the Masoretic text Adam? Not that I know of. it might be some sort of numerical significance that we don't understand anymore. Dude, okay, so next week we're going to talk about biblical chronology when we talk about the Exodus, and I'm going to uh, talk about that quite a bit to the point where you never want to hear about numbers ever again. 
But yes, the Septuagint does some goofy things with the genealogy, and uh, nobody knows why. Uh, oh, and the question was about uh, the significance of the differences in the numbers between the Septuagint and the uh, Masoretic text. Ooh, question yeah. in the chat. Oh, yeah, I see it. Question from the chat. Couldn't the blurring of the lines between what is mythological and historical in Genesis have occurred by Paul's time, uh, like during one of the language shifts during an exile? The blurring of the lines between... So I don't exactly understand this question, but I will say this, uh, which is uh, relevant. So between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament, uh, we have this period known as the Second Temple Period, um, where the uh, Jewish people return from exile, they uh, rebuilt their Second Temple, or they rebuilt their temple, there's the second one, uh, and then it was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, shortly after, um, the, or con roughly contemporaneous with the, the New Testament. During that time period, um, there was a lot of literature, and I mean a ridiculous amount of literature that was generated, and um, primarily by these uh, Jewish people in exile. And an overwhelming, like, there is an enormous amount of literature called um, scriptural rewriting, which in t modern parlance would just best be categorized as Bible fan fiction. Uh, where these people, the, the, the Jewish people, were reflecting on the mysterious characters of the Old Testament, in particular Enoch, Adam, and Methuselah. Those were the big three. Uh, and they wrote tons of stories about these guys. Um, and a lot of speculation was made uh, regarding what their activities were. So the entire, there's a thing called the first book of Enoch. Highly recommend reading it, uh, preferably uh, you know, in a safe environment where you don't have to operate heavy machinery because it'll burn your brain. But um, very wild story where um, Adam and Methuselah and these guys are involved in a lot of different things in human history. Uh, and so Adam was really used quite a bit in all of these stories to do different theological things and definitely things that were nowhere attested to in the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, for example, I believe, oh man, I'm going, I'm, I'm going rogue here. I may get this wrong. But I believe Adam was involved actually in the uh, debate this is a pseudepigraphal account where there was a debate between Satan and uh, Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. This is a particular incident that's brought up. I don't remember where. I think it's in the Book of the Watchers. And if I remember correctly, Adam was like involved in that at some point. Um, obviously, it has nothing to do with the Old Testament. So when you ask this question, could the blurring of historical and mythological lines, the main argument that I think is the most persuasive uh, against the position that I've taken, would be to say Paul is in this tradition of Bible fan fiction writing, and he is just using Adam like all of his other contemporaries were. They use them for crazy wild fan fiction stuff. He's using Adam for the gospel, so that's a much more noble uh, enterprise. Um, that's actually the position of a book we'll talk about later called Adam and the Genome. Uh, there's a New Testament scholar who makes this argument, uh, which I, I, I don't find it totally persuasive, but it's definitely interesting. Any other comments or questions? Okay, cool. So let's talk about some theological models real quick. So the first one is Adam and Eve are individual biological ancestors of the whole human race. Um, they were either created recently, so like 10,000 years ago, or anciently, like hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and they were created as the biological ancestors of the entire human race. This term biological is a major weasel word, which we'll get back to once we talk a little bit about the scientific data. Um, now, the recent versus ancient comes from our discussion last week where we talked about the age of the earth can go kind of either way. This is not really nailing down a question, or sorry, nailing down a position on that at this time. So the second view is individual representative ancestors. Adam and Eve were a divinely selected pair in a group of human ancestors to federally represent the human race. Oh my goodness, where did this group come from? You're reading into the text. This doesn't exist. This is made up. I am reporting you for concordism. Okay, so tangent. Did Adam have contemporaries? Um, th this is like the big question that is, is super significant. If Adam and Eve are the only ones at the beginning, then that's going to create major problems. So let's find a way to weasel in uh, other human beings. Um, historically, this has actually been a legitimate debate. So. I'm just going to, I'm not, again, not going to tell you one way or the other what to think about this, but a couple of considerations. Genesis 1 tasks human beings to fill the earth and subdue the earth, the entire planet. Whereas Genesis 2 says that human beings, Adam and Eve, are to work and tend the Garden of Eden. 
no real indication to go outside the garden. So this has caused some people to think maybe there are two separate groups of humans. A big group of humans at the beginning that are told to basically conquer the earth, and a separate, uh, more intimate group, Adam and Eve, to take care of this garden. Um, and so it could be the case that these are two separate events. Of course, the, uh, the big one that everyone knows is Cain's wife. Where did Cain get his wife, right? So Cain has this incident in Genesis 4. He kills his brother. Now he's scared of other people. He takes his wife, and he goes and builds a city. In like half of a phrase, like an independent clause of a verse, there has been so much speculation on where his wife came from, who he was afraid of, and who he built the city with. And so some people suggest, oh, well, there were just other people around. The um, Bible just didn't talk about it. So there are two solutions here, uh, two possible solutions that have been brought up. The first one is Genesis 1 has an in mass creation of human beings, so you have a whole bunch of human beings that show up, and then later Adam and Eve are selected from that group for a special revelation of God. The other suggestion is the exact inverse, where you have Adam and Eve, they show up as the first humans on the scene, and then they're banished from exile, and then the other human beings just sort of show up, but they're not necessarily descended from Adam and Eve. Both of these views have been defended historically in, in Christianity and Judaism. Um, if you want my own personal leanings, I think that the second option fits a little better with the text. You have these human beings that are created, and then suddenly people just sort of show up in the narrative, almost like Adam and Eve were banished and then just ran into people. Uh, um, that seems to fit better with me, but, you know, whatever works for you. Okay, so the whole point of that tangent was just to say there's at least precedent exegetically for the existence of human beings outside of Adam and Eve, either before them or contemporaneous with them. Okay, so we've got our individual biological ancestors. Uh, we now have the individual representative ancestors. So they're individuals that are selected, but they represent a group. Uh, the other is the inverse of that. There's a group representation. So God creates a group, and then these just happen to be, Adam and Eve happen to be the most prominent ones. And then the last one is just to say there is no Adam and Eve. They're just purely literary characters, and that's it. So broadly speaking, we have individual biological ancestors, we have representatives as a part of a group, or we have that they are just these literary characters, and that's it. Okay. So with that, now we'll look at the scientific data. But are there any, uh, let me pause one more time if there are any comments or questions just on these three and a half views. No comments. I'm checking the chat. Okay. Okay. So let's tie a bow, put that on the shelf, and let's look at some scientific data. Now, full transparency here. I am not an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a geneticist. I have never looked at a strand of DNA since 10th grade whenever I did a lab in biology class. So massive caveat to what I'm about to say. Now, there are two major claims whenever it comes to this debate over Adam and Eve and population genetics and what have you. The first one is the claim of common ancestry. So I'll state it exactly as is. Modern human beings, that is Homo sapiens, share a common ancestor with other primates, chimpanzees, for example. The second one, the second claim is that the ancestral population of human beings has never been lower than a few thousand people. So another way to say that is, if you go back in time, uh, you'll reach these genetic bottlenecks well, there have definitely been extinction, well, near extinction events. The uh, human population has gotten real small. It's never gone down to two. It's always been at least three to 10,000. Okay? Obviously, that's going to cause some problems down the road. So let's look at this first one. Do human beings share a common ancestor with chimpanzees? Uh, so here's the claim. So evolutionary theory predicts that the genomes that we observe in living primates, humans and chimpanzees will be our primary one, are in fact modified forms of an original genome that was present in the common ancestor of those species. And there are four main lines of evidence. The first one is the similarity of the gene sequencing. So another way of saying that is genetic homology. Um, and that actually goes all the way down uh, to the amino acid level and even the nucleotide level. So it's a very, and I'll show you an example in a minute, what I mean by that. Uh, so we have similar genes. You wouldn't expect that if we weren't related. Uh, the second one is what's called centeny. Uh, and synteny is the view that not only are these genes performing the same functions, they're in the exact same order. They don't necessarily have to be in the same order on the chromosome, but they are in the same order, which is kind of weird. Like, why would the order be the same? 
Um, the last two are historical evidences, so pseudogenes. There are genes that are no longer functional in our uh, genome. They don't do anything. They don't contribute to fitness. They're, they're just there, um, and yet they're shared between uh, chimpanzees and um, human beings. It's kind of weird. And then perhaps, again, the, uh, like we mentioned last week, perhaps the single strongest piece of evidence is, are these endogenous retroviruses. So uh, viruses in the past, sometimes what will happen is that they will infect uh, a, a host organism, and if that, or and whenever they do that, they actually inject their own DNA into the uh, body, or I guess it would be RNA. Again, 10th grade biology is why I'm going off of here. But in any event, um, if uh, these viruses inject their uh, uh, genetic code into um, a germ cell, such as a, a sperm or an egg, that little line of code will then actually be propagated all the way down to uh, whatever that organism's progeny happens to be. So let me give you an example here. This is from uh, a great paper by Dennis Venema called Genesis and the Genome, where he surveys basically all of the evidence and then starts to make some theological applications uh, in the space of like 10 pages. It's a great paper. Um, and so this right here, uh, to interpret this as best I can, um, so this is just the first line of the nucleotide coding sequence for pre-proinsulin. Not sure exactly what that is. I'm pretty sure it's what codes for insulin. Um, and the important thing is that these, uh, these letters here on the left uh, represent homo sapiens, pantroglodytes, chimps, uh, the gorillas, and then some more primates. Um, and if you read it this way, this is actually how you're supposed to, how you're supposed to read it. And the black uh, letters indicate a difference between whatever this line is and the human uh, line, or the homo sapien uh, line. So you can notice, just this is like a really small snippet, um, but there's a lot of similarity there. And here's what's really significant. If you look down here, these numbers tell you how many different ways uh, these particular, again, I'm going to throw, mess this up, uh, but this right here tells you how many codons, I believe, uh, could be used to code for this particular output. Um, so case in point, I believe this is alanine right here. There are four different ways that you can actually code for alanine, but all six of these species have the exact same way that they're doing it, which is really weird. Um, perhaps an analogy would be if you think that someone's plagiarized a paper uh, and it turns out that every adjective that they use, whenever there are thousands of synonyms, they happen to use the same adjectives every single time. That's a little suspicious, right? Um, so especially, especially with these case. So, you know, there are six ways to code this and they all happen to be exactly the same. Um, it's a little suspicious, okay? Uh, the other piece of evidence, which I think is a little more easier to wrap your head around, definitely easier for me to wrap my head around, is the endogenous retroviruses. So if you look here, these are retroviruses that are inserted and they're shared by pretty much all mammals. So HERV, uh, L, this is human uh, endogenous retrovirus, uh, particular one is L, don't know what that means in all honesty. Um, but this is shared between human beings all the way over here and pretty much all these mammals have uh, this particular uh, uh, endogenous retrovirus. And you can see that all of these retroviruses are shared along all of these different mammals, including uh, primates and most notably chimpanzees. Again, these do not, these are inserted in the human genome historically. Like they're not actually generated by us. It's a, a, an event in the past that has been propagated through our progeny. So it's very strange if you want to say that they were designed to look that way. This is very peculiar. Okay. So critique of common ancestry. Like we talked about last week, the main response is common design. Um, and I'm just going to be honest with you that I think that common design works in principle for these functional regions. Uh, you can definitely say, yeah, well, of course the you know, different codons are all coding the same way. God didn't want to make them any different. Ain't, you know, ain't broke, don't fix it. But why? Why the endogenous retroviruses? This to me is just a mystery. I, I have not encountered a good response to this. Um, maybe there is one, but I haven't encountered it, in all honesty. Uh, the fact that there are six different ways or four different ways to code the same protein, which would presumably do the same thing, also suggests that it's not just common design. Well, um, I mean, so the question was about if there's you know six ways to skin a cat, why are you all using the same way? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I could see either way on that. I, I mean, I reuse a lot of my own designs whenever I design stuff, even though I don't have to. Um, efficiency, but then that's going to run into your theodicies when you say God's not efficient because, you know, why make a big universe? He's not efficient. He's an artist. It's, 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 I don't understand. 
I, again, the endogenous retrovirus, that's the one that keeps making me, uh, that's the one that keeps me up at night, if you will, right? Okay, so again, um, one other comment on this. There are a lot of intelligent design advocates that really don't care about uh, if Adam and Eve have genetic ancestry that shared with the primates and uh, other life on Earth. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is uh, as an acceptable view in the Catholic Church as well. The Catholics in the room can correct me on that. Yes, I'm correct, or yes, I'm wrong. Right. Okay, I'm correct. So, there we go. So common design, or not common design, sorry, common ancestry or shared ancestry with primates doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, personally. Um, or at least, you know, if you say that Adam and Eve were made from pre-existing stuff or something, I don't know exactly what it is, but this doesn't seem to be that significant. Now, this other one does seem to be more significant, and that is the ancestral population of human beings has never been lower than a few thousand. Uh, because it's one thing to say, well, maybe Adam and Eve showed up and there were a monkey's uncle or something like that, but uh, everyone after them was a human. No, not, not if you say they had thousands of other people around them. This is where things start to get dicey. So let me just quote here. This is Dennis Venema that wrote that uh, article that I referenced earlier. Oh, I'm out of work. So I'll just quote him. Uh, this is uh, Adam and the Genome. I recommend this book not as, uh, or purely educational purposes, not an endorsement, purely educational. So here's what he says. As our methodology becomes more sophisticated and more data are examined, we will likely revise our estimates in the future. He's talking about population sizes. That said, we can be confident that finding evidence that we were created separately from other animals or that we descend only from two uh, people just isn't going to happen. Some ideas in science are so well supported that it is highly unlikely that new evidence will substantially modify them. Among these, the sun is at the center of the universe, or sorry, solar system. The sun is at the center of our solar system. Humans evolved, and we evolved as a population. Pretty dicey, right? Um, so, why think this? So, quick biology review. This is actually more for me than it is for you. Um, all right, this is a chromosome, and this is an allele. Uh, and as I'm sure you all remember from your, your Punnett squares, uh, that you have homozygous and heterozygous uh, alleles. So, you know, you have big A, big A, little A, little A, big A, little A, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all that good stuff. Um, and allele frequency is usually what is defined as evolution. Whenever you have a population and allele frequency changes over time, this is usually what we mean by evolution. Um, so keep this in mind whenever we talk about alleles and chromosomes and whatnot. Okay. So, Here's the main four reasons that people think we evolved from a population. The first one is just the multiplicity of alleles. There's just way too many of them to have originated from two people. The second one is um, the effective population estimates, uh, and that has to do with the way this stuff is calculated. We'll talk about that in a minute. Another one is transspecies variation. Um, again, we'll talk about that in a minute. And the second one is the divergence of alleles, which is um, there may be a bunch of them, but they may be close together. So it's not that big a deal. But divergence of alleles says that there's actually a large mutational distance between the alleles that are here. Um, again, that distance is hard to traverse if you just originate from two people. So as promised, we'll talk about these two in a little bit more detail. Um, now this, I'm actually, I'm probably going to struggle really hard on this. So this right here, uh, these are phylogenetic trees for uh, human beings, chimpanzees, and gorillas. So H, C, and G. Um, a, the tree A right here, this is the species uh, tree. So biologists believe that human beings uh, had a common ancestor with humans, chimps, and gorillas, with, and uh, the human chimp line diverged from the gorilla line a long time ago, and then more recently, humans and chimps uh, had a common ancestor, and then that divergence is there. So there's a hypothetical time axis up and down right here. Now, what you'll notice on this other uh, line, on this center one, um, this is actually a, uh, this is a gene tree. So there are sections of our DNA that um, do not necessarily line up with chimpanzees. So you would think that if we, in fact, uh, shared common ancestry with a chimpanzee uh, much earlier than a gorilla, then our DNA and our genome would be basically identical to a chimpanzee with, sorry, chimpanzee with a couple of variations. If you look at a uh, gorilla genome that our divergence would also be much, you know, be much more divergent than it is from the chimpanzee. I don't know if that's making a lot of sense. But the simple thing is that sometimes the wires get crossed. In other words, there are sections of our DNA that is closer to a gorilla than it is to a chimpanzee. And there are some sections 
where a chimpanzee is closer to a gorilla than it is to us. In other words, the line of descent gets blurred. And so the hypothesis here is that uh, with this type of variation, that really all of these divergent lines, all of these gene divergent lines, are not going back to nice, neat, clean speciation events, but they're rather going back to a massive ancestral population that had enormous amounts of variation and that all of these lines were then preserved throughout the different species. I don't know if that really, I don't know if y'all are tracking with me or not. I'm kind of barely tracking with myself, uh, to be honest with you. But broadly what it's saying is that variations between the species uh, cannot be attributed to nice, neat, clean, you know, divergence uh, events. Don't know if that made a whole lot of sense or not. Um, but in any event, that is just to say that one way you can calculate uh, the effective population size is to go back and look for um, how big of a population is necessary in order to get it on that assumption. You assume that humans, chimps, and uh, uh, gorillas all went back to a giant population. You assume that all that variation that we observe today is present in that population. You do some really complicated math, and then you get, you know, spit out a number. We'll actually talk about the math in a little bit more detail in a second. Okay. Um, so, if you didn't track with that, that's fine. I barely did. Here's the venomous uh, conclusion, which is taken individually and collectively, again, those four lines of evidence we talked about, population genomics strongly suggests that our lineage has not experienced an extreme population bottleneck in the last nine million years, and any bottlenecks our lineage did experience were a reduction only to a population of several thousand breeding individuals. And as such, the hypothesis that humans are genetically derived from a single ancestral pair in the recent past has no support from a genomics perspective and indeed is counter to a large body of evidence. In other words, you have to answer this question. If we only came from two people, then why are there sections of our DNA that agree more with a gorilla's DNA than it does even with a chimpanzee's DNA? That's kind of what the argument is, is saying. Um, now, some critiques of this. So we talked about critiques for your common ancestry. Yeah, they're not so great. Critiques for population estimates. Guys, my brain cannot handle this amount of information, so just track with me as best you can. So this guy, let me back up. This guy right here, Joshua Swamidas, very interesting man. Got to meet him earlier this year. Computational biologist at uh, University of Washington in St. Louis. He um, does this stuff for a living, and he does math for a living. Um, and he has basically taken, taken venomous arguments to task and said, no, th this is wrong from beginning to end. Um, and there are three main critiques that he has of Venema's arguments. The first one is what he calls the window fallacy, which is when we're talking about this breeding group of individuals, we're not talking about a snapshot in time, like, oh, this is you know, uh, exactly how many people were present at this time. It's a moving average. What these uh, population geneticists are really calculating is saying, on average, that population could never really get below a certain threshold but it's certainly consistent with ups and downs throughout that time period. In fact, he says, if you think about it, oh, actually, no, my bad, I jumped the gun on that one. And so he says it, they, don't count, they don't account for special events, like they don't account for unique events. They're only talking about averages over time. Um, so the hypothesis of a genetic bottleneck of two really hasn't been tested. All we've said is that on average, there was never really a period of you know, a couple hundred years or so where it was two. But the Bible doesn't even claim that in the most strict terms. In the most strict terms, Adam and Eve, there were two of them, and they immediately had children, and they immediately had children, and they immediately had children. So even on the strictest terms, this was not even what's uh, being claimed by the Bible. Now the second one is the ecological fallacy, which I don't know why he called it this, but this is what he called it. And this is uh, probably the more poignant one. Because he's saying that the data that's indicated by population genetics is that the ancestral population of Homo sapiens, on average, never dipped below a few thousand. That is not the same as the population of Homo sapiens never bottlenecked to two. So think about that for a minute. He's saying your ance our ancestors, you know, the genetic pool that we're drawing from is definitely bigger than two, but that doesn't mean that our species at one point could not have been two. In fact, he says, tongue in cheek, at one point it was zero. So obviously it can dip below several thousand because at one point there were zero Homo sapiens and then there were a bunch of Homo sapiens and if, let's say for you know, 50 years, there were two of them. Is that contradictory? No, it's totally consistent with the evidence. And the last one is what I call the genetic fallacy. It's not the genetic fallacy, it's the genetic fallacy. And this is where things start to get really spicy. So he says, look, the entire 
one of the fundamental assumptions of population genetics is wrong because you're calculating to the most recent common ancestor of a DNA segment. But that is not actually what you're needing to calculate. Because he says, if you think about it, recall from our brief biology lesson, um, you have a, uh, on, on a chromosome, an allele, you basically have uh, four variations for any given allele, um, which is, you know, big A, little a, big B, little b, for example. And if you're heterozygous, then that means that you have a full copy of big A, a full copy of little a, a and your partner would have a full copy of big B, a full copy of little b, et cetera, et cetera. So what he's saying is what we need to calculate, as, let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that the uh, genetic ancestors of all human beings were fully heterozygous. In other words, they had a full complete copy of one allele, a full complete copy of another allele, and their partner had exactly the opposite, and there were no duplications or anything like that. Let's assume that for the case. What we're really calculating is not the time to the most recent common ancestor, or even to the population size that we're looking for. What we're really looking for is the time to the most recent four alleles. Because if we calculate the time to the most recent four alleles, that will tell us who's responsible for all of the genetic variation that we have uh, in uh, humanity today. Now, this can be uh, falsified if on any particular locus in your chromosome you have more than four alleles. So Amadas claims that's not the case. He says that actually there's really only a maximum of four. Well, honestly, I have no idea if he is correct on that. But that's what he claims, so we'll go with it. And so he says, if we calculate the time to the most recent four alleles, we do a bunch of math, and we actually find that a single pair bottleneck is completely consistent with our genetic evidence, so long as it happens 500,000 years ago. Now, that's actually kind of interesting. And if you want to read the math, I encourage you to go to this link, um, where he's actually taking a bite at um, uh, Venema, because it's his website, peacefulscience.org, called Heliocentric Certainty Against a Bottleneck of Two. Taking a jab at the whole, oh, really, is the sun the center of the solar system. Guys, it says 35 minute read at the top. It is not 35 minute read. It is an enormous amount of mathematics. I highly recommend you read it. See if you can understand it better than I can. But that's the basic top line summary, is the hypothesis that you have two fully heterozygous uh, homo sapiens, or not homo sapiens, full two heterozygous um, ancestors that uh, 500,000 years ago, there's nothing to rule out there's no evidence against a convergence of a bottleneck of two 500,000 years ago. That's his main takeaway. Um, refresher on alleles if you need that. Okay, what did Venema say to this? So last year, um, he, said, he wrote a blog post called, or, and he said, basically, based on new simulations and some other published studies that we drew upon, our group came to an agreement. If an event like this had happened, i.e. a bottleneck of two people, we would be able to uh, detect it if it happened more recently than 500,000 years ago. That was surprising to me, to be sure. I thought beforehand an event like that would show up even further back in time. Basically, he's saying, once you get past 500,000 years, there's no way to rule this out. The evidence just isn't there. Now, in true form, he says, hear me well. There's zero positive evidence that any event such as this actually occurred. And I think he's actually right. These all of these simulations uh, that Swamidas and uh, some of their other colleagues were doing, they are entirely motivated by this hypothesis that they're committed to an, a, a single ancestral pair from which all of humanity originated. There's no positive evidence. But what it does do is it says that original claim that there never was a bottleneck, that has been overstated. And I think that's a very significant find. Uh, and for Venema to at least admit that much, I think is also pretty, uh, pretty significant. So. Let's do an evaluation. Individual biological ancestry. Scripture says that's the most natural reading of the text, although we've got some mystery characters like Cain's wife, we don't know what to do with them. This could potentially be contradicted by population genetics depending on where you put them in the timeline. Okay. Group version number one, it resolves some of the background character tension. Okay, Cain got his wife because she was part of this wider population. It also fits with some other interesting textual things that we don't have time for. But with the science, again, it's a group of people, so you can put them basically anywhere you want in the timeline, so long as it makes sense. Um, and broadly speaking, this is compatible with uh, population genetics. Uh, the uh, group version number two, look, there's no serious indication in the Bible that God actually created a group of people in the Garden of Eden. It's just not there. And I think this is eisegesis, frankly. Um, but uh, again, with the science, nothing really to rule it out scientifically. 
Now, pure literary characters, obviously they're compatible with uh, science because they don't make any scientific claims. But with scripture, can purely literary characters actually bear the weight of Paul's theology? I'm not 100% convinced that they can. Um, and again, with the science, they make no scientific claim. So what we see here is that the biological ancestry is under severe tension. It seems to be under severe tension with the population genetics. But as we talked about, as long as Adam and Eve lived 500,000 years ago, it doesn't seem to be any problem uh, with affirming the full natural view. There's definitely some tension with the group's views uh, because, again, if you put them back at like 6,000 years ago, that's probably not going to work out. Um, if you put them back a couple hundred thousand years ago, there's no way to say one way or the other. So, um, I actually have some more stuff on here. Dang it, I don't know that we'll actually have time to it. So, so um, I'm actually going to buzz through this next session really quickly, but let me pause if there are any comments or, uh, comments or questions. So, it, I, I, I'm not sure if it's the same, but do you know about Engager's argument about there being an ancestral pair? And I think she was using population genetic. Is it similar to Swami Das's um, mm -hmm. argument? Yes. Um, so the question was about uh, Ann Gager. So Ann Gager is a fellow at the Discovery Institute, and she has some other stuff too. Um, so whenever Venema here, oh, dang it, i got to go through this whole thing again. All right, so when Venema was talking about um, our group up here. Our group consists of Dennis Venema and uh, Gager, or Gager, I don't know how her name is pronounced, a guy named Richard Bugs, Swami Das, and like five other people that I don't remember. Um, so uh, Ann Gager is also, you know, she's a, she actually does not affirm common ancestry, whereas Swami Das does. Um, her argument was, uh, primarily based, so her argument, as long as this other guy, I forget what his name is, it's also Dutch, so I can't pronounce it, um, they were the ones that came up with this 500,000 year ago convergence on two people view. Swamidas was the one who contributed the most recent four alleles thing. And basically, uh, you put those things together, you know, they get married and have a baby, which is this weird view that uh, ultimately Venema admits is not impossible. So yeah, it's, it's related. Uh, it seems like if we are pushing the timeline back 500,000 years ago, uh, it seems we lose the ability to say anything historically significant about the individuals Adam yeah. and Eve. Yeah, that is a very, very good point. So the question was, or the comment rather, was about if we accept this and say Adam and Eve positively lived 500,000 years ago, that's going to severely diminish a lot of our uh, claims about them historically. Uh, because the Bible, you know, these stories are written, depending on your view, 1200 B.C. Uh, to 500 B.C. Um, so you're, you're talking about literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years transpiring uh, for this narrative uh, before you get to it. I actually have a comment at the very end about that. I'm sorry? Major holes in any genealogy. That, that is exactly right. Very good point. Yeah, so the, the, the comment was about the genealogy. So your genealogies, we mentioned last week, you can definitely telescope genealogies. This happens all the time. happens in the Bible. Uh, Jesus' genealogy is compressed down to 14 people. Obviously, or sorry, three sets of 14. Way more people were involved. Um, so you would have to say that you have from 500,000 B.C.-ish all the way up to uh, Abraham, who's probably 1500 B.C., you have that compressed all the way down into a single chapter. Um, it's not impossible, but it's front-loaded. In other words, you basically have, uh, I'm going to screw this up so much. Well, I have, a, I have like a whole developed thing on this. It's at the very <laughs> end of the presentation. Though. Basically, um, you have Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, 500,000 years, Lamech, uh, is more or less how that goes. Uh, and you can't really, and, and then Lamech says, well, wait, I know Cain, you know, because he says if Cain's anger is uh, sevenfold, let Lamech's be 77-fold or something to that effect. So where are these gaps supposed to be? I don't know. Um, and that's where you have to lean on the mytho-historical uh, interpretation to just say this is a compressed account of human history 
Um, and at that point, honestly, you're, you're getting basically, yeah, some historical events happen, but it's more literary than it is, myth it's more mytho than it is historical at that point. I actually have some specific comments on this in a minute, but um, are there any other comments on, on uh, this survey right here? Dr. Craig wants to push it, push it back to 750,000. I just, I just oh, saw him say that yeah. today. Oh, uh, yeah, I have, I have a thing on that, too. Okay. Well, so we're, we're short on time, but um, I want to buzz through really, really quickly on this idea. So I want to talk about biological ancestry. So far, we have been talking just about this question, which is genetic progenitorship. But what we just mentioned was the Bible doesn't have anything about genetics in it. It has genealogies, right? Um, and then the second question, which is when did Adam and Eve live? So far, what we're talking about is if we assume they are the sole genetic progenitors of the entire human race, scientifically, unless we dispute the science, unless we you know, pull out our own calculators and do population genetics ourselves, we're looking at 500,000 years ago. But is that the only way to take biological uh, ancestry? So uh, let me look at this real quick. I'm going to buzz through this super fast. Swami Das does not actually accept the view that he was just defending. He just says population genetics is uh, fake news. Well, it's not fake news. It's just overstated. Right? So here's an interesting insight. When you talk about genetic ancestry, your genetic ancestry dilutes as you go further back in time. So think about this. You have half of your father's DNA. You have 25% of your grandfather's DNA. You have 12.5% of your great-grandfather's DNA. You don't have to go back more than about 10 generations, and you're talking about someone who is your, you are the direct descendant of somebody who has effectively 0% of their DNA is present uh, in your genome. So is genetics really the most reliable guide to discovering our ancestry and our relationships? And like I said, this is a very weird way. Like, we're used to it because we're 50 years past uh, uh, Barbara McClintock's uh, discovery of DNA, which was then stolen by Francis uh, uh, Crick and all those guys. But, you know, conversation for a different time. But the world, looking at the world through a DNA lens is very new. The more ordinary definition is genealogy. And genealogy has the opposite effect of genetics. It actually compounds. So consider this. You are, you have one father, and you have two great, uh, two grandfathers. You have four great-great-grandfathers. You have eight grandfathers, et cetera, et cetera. It goes up exponentially as you go further back in your family tree. Now, I'm gonna, I know it's late, but follow me here on the math. If you're going exponentially up in your family tree as you're going backwards in time, but the real population of human beings goes down exponentially as we go back in time. We're headed towards a convergence, a singularity, if you will, where the, uh, basically everyone's genealogies is eventually, almost by mathematical necessity, they're going to have to overlap at some point. And you're eventually going to have to have a point where people all have the same great, 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 great grandfather. So this is what Swamidas argues in his book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve. And he says, we need to look at this through the lens of genealogical science and not the lens of genetic science. Because if we look at it genetically, we're not going to get any uh, sensible answers. Um, and so basically, this is what he's arguing for. He says, Adam and Eve, if we assume that there are genetic ancestors from 10,000 years ago, obviously not everyone's related to them. The population genetics works at 10,000 years. We, there's no way that, that this is true. And uh, like he was saying, the traditional account, you know, the biblical traditional account is that everyone on earth is descended from Adam and Eve. And so his synthesis of this is Adam and Eve were created 10,000 years ago. Um, and as it turns out, through the necessity of genealogical uh, ancestry and whatnot, it turns out that every person on the face of the earth shares an ancestor at 10,000 years. And he says, why don't we just use the Bible and supplement our knowledge there and say it's Adam and Eve. Bingo, bango, bongo, done, right? And ta-da, we now have found something that's compatible with the, tradi the traditional account and compatible with the mainstream science account and actually respects the text for what it is, mainly a genealogical account of human uh, origins, not a genetic account of human origins. Very interesting. In fact, if you're interested in this, I'd recommend you get his book. We have a couple of free copies if you come see me after the meeting. If you're very interested in this, uh, I'll uh, give you one. So there are two ways of answering this question of biological ancestry genetically and genealogically. So if we say that genetic ancestry is important for whatever our, our theological reasons may be, we're pretty much committed to a 500,000 year ago Adam and Eve. If we say that Adam and Eve are our genealogical ancestors, we have the freedom to say they existed 10,000 years ago or earlier. Obviously, if they were past 10,000 years ago, they're still our genealogical ancestors. 
So now the question is, how do you answer this? Um, so one last run through on these, and then we'll, we'll wrap up real quickly. So individual biological ancestors, our objection is, this is contradicted by population genetics. Well, genealogical ancestry converges at about six to 10,000 years ago, whereas genetic ancestry converges at 500,000 years ago. So we've kind of done away, for the most part, with this objection. Um, again, scripture, this seems to be the most natural reading. So as long as you're willing to bite the bullet and say they lived 500,000 years ago, seems like you're fine. We talk about the individual group ancestors. Um, again, they're compatible on depending on the timeline. So put them at 200,000 years ago to account for the oldest human remains, and you're fine. Um, put them back older, doesn't matter. Again, this genealogical ancestry kicks in at about 10,000 years, so your theology is good anywhere older than 6,000 years. Um, so again, our only tensions that are left now are with scripture. They're not actually with the scientific data for the most part. So this is kind of where uh, I think Swamidas' contributions, uh, this book came out just last year, and I, I really think that they haven't really percolated all the way down uh, yet, because I think this is a pretty significant argument. Uh, it goes a long way to resolving the Adam and Eve debate. A lot of people just flat out reject anything to do with evolution because uh, I need Adam and Eve in my theology. And if Swamidas, if his book is correct, he says you can accept all of evolution, you can accept even the worst forms of evolution, like neo-Darwinism, and it doesn't affect your, this theology. And I think that's a very significant uh, argument. Now, transparency, I don't agree with him on everything, um, but I think that's still pretty significant. So, let's wrap up here. So, are Adam and Eve in conflict with population genetics? Probably not. The only way they're gonna be in conflict is if you assume both the Bible is discussing genetic ancestry and if that genetic ancestor is more recent than 500,000 years ago. Um, now, the second question is, what are the views of Adam and Eve that are theologically permissible for what uh, we need Christian theology to do? Um, and like we've said, we've been going over the spectrum of views that broadly you've got individual biological ancestors, you have important people in a group, and you have literary characters. Um, and so there are multiple views, and most of them are not really gonna be sorted out by the science. Like we said, depending on the flavor you take, there are definitely versions of each one that are compatible with science, even compatible with full-scale evolutionary accounts of human origin. So it's really gonna come down to the secondary theological considerations. Now by secondary, I do not mean secondary in importance. These are very important things, but secondary in inference. We've only been talking thus far about the raw biblical data, but once you start synthesizing the data into a theological system, you know, secondary inferences, then you're gonna have to reevaluate that list of questions, um, which is, what exactly are, is Adam, or are Adam and Eve doing in my theology? If I'm committed to a particular view of original sin, for example, that original sin started with Adam and it is literally propagated, uh, in some sense biologically, to his progeny, I'm gonna have to accept that he's the genetic ancestor of the human race, for example. Um, Another question I think is very significant is the nature of the image of God. If the image of God is, um, well here, I'll actually give you one example right here. Uh, so William Lane Craig, guy all the way at the beginning, this is actually his reasoning for where Adam and Eve go. So he ad adheres to a view of the image of God called structuralism, which means that when we say someone is the image of God, that means it, it is tied to, it is inherent to, and it is inherited from biology in a sense. Case in point, brain capacity, uh, ca uh, capacity for uh, speech, uh, free will, things of that nature. And this is indicated by certain activities. So his argument is there are certain activities, there's significant evidence of other hominin uh, creatures that do significantly interesting things, such as cave drawings or making spears or even tying uh, complicated uh, twine. And so his argument goes, well, you need to be able to do sophisticated reasoning in order to do these things. Therefore, these people, Neanderthals, for example, are in the image of God. If they're in the image of God, they had to have gotten it from Adam and Eve. Therefore, Adam and Eve have to be the ancestors of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Therefore, Adam and Eve are most likely Homo heidelbergensis, which lived about 750,000 years ago. See that? Now this reasoning, now notice this reasoning. This is not from the text, it's not from the science. It's from a secondary inference. His specific view of the image of God and how Adam and Eve play a role in that 
lead to his conclusion Adam and Eve existed 750,000 years ago. See that? So this is where this is where things get dicey. And like I said, eight independent uh, doctrines involve Adam and Eve. So you can literally have upwards of 360,000 different permutations. And it does explain why it would be the case that he would so fervently go from that. Because then if he said, well, Neanderthals have the image of God, mm-hmm. um, and they're before Adam and Eve, so, in, in yeah. other words, he's, he's, in a, he's in a quandary because yeah, he can't exactly. say that, right? Yeah, exactly. You, it, in, in, on his interpretation of the image of God, you cannot have people in the image of God before Adam and Eve. So this is one example. Now, there was a mention earlier about uh, the historical reference, or sorry, the historical relevance of the narratives. I'm going to show you the flip side of this argument. This is another just example. This is reasoning from the Genesis narratives. So if you read the narratives... And even the theology of like Genesis 1 through 5, the activities described and the theology communicated indicate agrarian society. For example, in Genesis 2, when there was no man to till the earth. That's an agrarian reference. Cain and Abel are, you know, the farmer and the sheep herder. Um, The pun that is made when Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? This is a specific pun based on sheep herding and sheep keeping. Um, or Cain went east of Eden and built a city. So he's building, you know, he built the city of Nod. All of those activities are indicative of uh, basically the, ar- the archaeology says this type of like sheep herding and, you know, animal keeping and agriculture and city building, you know, the typical settlers of Catan world. Archaeologically, in the Levant, that's like the Neolithic Revolution, which was 12,000 years ago. You go back 500,000 years ago, you're not going to see cities, you're not going to see sheep pens, uh, you're not going to see altars to gods. You just don't see these types of things. So therefore, if you take these narratives seriously and you take them as actually referring to, in some sense, historical activities, Adam and Eve lived about 10,000 years ago. Make sense? So this is, this is what I'm getting at, right? So this is saying, well, because of my commitment to the image of God, and because of that, I'm going to put Adam and Eve 750,000 years ago so I can have Neanderthals in with the image of God. Um, that's weird. I don't know what to do with the narratives, but fine. Another way, well, these narratives indicate agrarian Neolithic farmers, so they're probably, you know, 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, but that means that we had several hundred thousand years of hominins, you know, Neanderthals and whatnot doing stuff, probably dying. Don't know what to do with that. Don't know if they had free will. It's, it's intractable, I think. So... That's what I mean whenever I say that these are the secondary theological considerations that are going to drive what Adam and Eve uh, are. And all we've discussed so far is just the boundaries of where, uh, where those things are. So um, I'll just wrap up again on our conclusion slide here. There are a lot of different views that are compatible with the raw biblical data and the scientific data. Um, but it's ultimately going to come down to secondary inferences Uh, or secondary theological concerns on where you fall on this issue. And that is going to be a discussion for not now. Um, Well, now, we'll we'll stick around after, but I'm not going to keep you any longer. Uh, So next week we're going to end, this concludes our evolution excursus, and next week we are going to talk about Exodus. Um, And we're going to talk about the conquest, and we're going to talk about uh, did God command genocide with the Canaanites. A lot of fun stuff. Um, So with that, that's the official end meeting, so I will uh, get rid of this slide. So, so what do you all think? So discussion time. So what do, what do you think, this is just a sample, but which of these theological issues do you think are the most significant driving uh, the certain view of Adam or Eve that a person should take? So as far as the genealogical Adam and Eve, it seems uh, Probable that there could be multiple uh, genealogical common ancestors, either a set of them at the same period of time, or one individual who is incidentally part of everybody else's, like halfway down the chart. Um, it, why uh, do those individuals in everybody's genealogies, why do they have influence or not have influence over everybody else? Ah, very good question. Uh, So the question is, Adam and Eve, so it seems like 
any contemporary of Adam and Eve, or definitely any of their ancestors, they're also going to be universal genealogical ancestors. So why all this attention to Adam and Eve? An excellent question. So um, it's really simple, though. Why is all the attention given to Abraham as the father of the Hebrews, when obviously his father was also equally the father of the Hebrews? And his father was the father of the Hebrews, just as much as Abraham was. Because God came to Abraham and said, through your loins, all the nations will be blessed. God spoke to Abraham in a way that he did not speak to Abraham's father. Likewise, God came to Adam and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, etc., and had a special, unique relationship with him. That's why he gets all the attention, and it's because of his shenanigans that caused all the problems. Through one man's trespass, Adam's trespass, all these other people uh, were made uh, subject to death. But through one man's righteousness, or dare I say one man's faith, Abraham, many will be made righteous. There's a good sermon point for you there. Presumably those people weren't subject to death until Adam entered their ancestry. Yeah, this is a great question. So I, I think that this is, this is probably one of the most significant theological questions, which is what is the relationship of death? How does Adam bring death into the world? if for literally hundreds of thousands of years, his genetic ancestors were living and dying and, and of terrible things. Yeah, common. I'm going to interject and throw in a view that I don't think has been discussed much in the theology, is that it's commonly assumed that Adam and Eve were in a natural state, that they, that not dying was natural to them in the Garden of Eden, that God created the nature of humanity to be not dead. Mm -hmm. But... Another way to think about it is to, is to assume that, well, maybe they were in a supernatural state, that they were preordained, um, not as just the, um, you know, the archetype of the human race, but instead to two people who were given grace by God to be supernatural, so to not die. Um, and with that came along free will and other, other certain things. So then, when they chose against God and they chose death, um, this was simply bringing them back into the natural state. That this, this didn't suddenly then make the death of anybody before them or at the same time as them, as them evil, but it simply made them no longer in their grace-infused state. They, they chose against God so that they in particular would have death. And this doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything odd about the other people around them at the same time. The other people around them simply were, didn't have grace infused. Yeah, yeah, th this is an excellent point. So the, the, the comment is, um, it seems like Adam and Eve, uh, we're assuming Adam and Eve were created immortal whenever they could have just been created mortal like all of their ancestors before them um, and that uh, the tree of life is sort of a gift from God um, and so their banishment was being kicked out of the uh, special you know, place where they more or less had access to immortality. I must say, I'm very sympathetic to this view, and I think it does make a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Where, because if you think about it, the punishment for Adam and Eve is not that they're killed dead on the spot. It's that their relationship with God is ruined, first of all, and he, he withdraws himself. He's no longer present. And the second thing is that they're kicked out of the garden um, away from the tree of life. Now, metaphorically, the tree of life is widely considered to be you know, the source of divine goodness and life and whatnot. This is uh, revisited in Revelation whenever John sees the tree of life in the center of the New Jerusalem, because presum presumably it's a metaphorical image of you know, resurrection, new life, and all that good stuff. And so it totally makes sense that, it's, it is not a, that the curse is more of deprivation than it is of anything else. Uh, God just kicks them out of the garden and they die. And presumably, if you're an old earth creationist anyway, you're going to be okay with animals dying before this whatever happens in this uh, garden-type place. The problem that I think significantly... Uh, that you're going to have to deal with then is what exactly is, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, oh, it's, the, it's a question of theodicy, right? Because if you think biologically uh, or anatomically modern humans that had the same brain structures and everything as we have today, that lived before Adam and Eve, that presumably had the same consciousness that we have, that were drawing cave art and self-representation and all that stuff, why are they suffering so much? Why are they in so much pain and suffering and dying in death for literally nothing, right? In fact, uh, Romans uh, 5, Paul makes the argument that 
is, uh, that God looked over the trespasses of that time, which some people have interpreted as being the pre-Adamites. God looked over the sins of the pre-Adamites. But why on earth is there so much suffering? And now you've just completely opened yourself up to a new theodicy. Um, and I think it's a significant question. Yeah. Have you ever read uh, William Dembski's sort of weird... Um, oh, yeah, 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 so, sort of the pre-fall. Yeah, so again, it's, you can, so the, the standard argument for animal death is just to say that animals don't suffer in the way humans suffer. So their death is very different from human death. And they don't have a spiritual connection to God anyway, so they don't experience physical death. Um, but when you're talking about anatomically modern humans that are living and dying and presumably suffering, it just seems very difficult to me. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't think there's a good answer to that, unless you're going to say that God um, wanted to. So the, the one theological reasoning chain could be that you know we humans currently live in a fallen world. God intervened with Abraham, and then intervened with Jesus, um, and each of those were kind of elevating human existence in a way that's pointing ultimately to the recreation and restoration of all things. But you would have to basically retroject that and say that. You know, you have all 100,000 years of human, uh, literally, you know, biological humans living and dying and suffering, and then God intervenes with Adam and Eve to, like, elevate creation to the next level. I don't know. It seems ad hoc to me. I, and, and to be quite honest, even though I definitely, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put a little card on the table. I lean towards thinking Adam and Eve probably lived 10,000 years ago. Uh, that makes the most sense to me. But I don't know what to do with all the people before them. You know? Yeah, yeah. So. Just to push back on the problem a bit, I think that it could be argued that under the view that they were raised in a supernatural state, then one could easily say that a natural state isn't inherently evil and that death isn't inherently evil. So Yeah. You're going to have to take that up with Paul, though, because he's saying death spread to all men because all sinned. That's his argument um, in, in Romans 5. And if you say that there are humans that are dying and they're not sinning, or they're dying and they're... And, sin, and it wasn't because of Adam? It's, I don't know. Now, I'll tell you Swami Das's answer, because I asked him about this um, in our uh, podcast, which I forgot to plug. We interviewed him earlier this year. So, who's heard of a philosophical zombie? Anybody heard of these? Okay. So, a philosophical zombie, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a person that looks exactly like us, behaves exactly like us, but they have no inner thought life at all. They have no self-awareness, they have no concept of themselves, or anything like that. Um, and the argument goes that there's literally no way you can distinguish from these individuals and actual human beings with self-consciousness. There's no way to do it. Swami Das says, well, that's what was going on. You had a bunch of basically biological robots that had no self-consciousness running around. So when they die, it's like they don't have a conscience so they're not sinning, and they don't have self-awareness so they're not suffering. Also fall in with Craig's uh, view that perhaps uh, Adam and Eve do need to be the first with Imago Dei, and so everyone else is philosophical zombies do yeah. not have Imago Dei. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's actually part of the argument, is that, is that, yeah, you cannot distinguish a person, like a person who has an inner thought life, from someone who has all the outward appearance of thought life. That's, that's Swami Das's argument. Swami Das is absurdly wrong because he missed the point of the, the thought experiment. It has nothing to do with this. But it's even worse because that means like Cain married a philosophical zombie. And what happens to his children at that point? Like what happened? Because that's the whole problem, right? The whole thing is we're supposed to inflate the genetic pool so that we can get the right genetic variants, which means Adam and Eve's children, who were full, true, self-aware human beings, were mating with zombies. Like... He had no answer to this, by the way. I don't think he understood my question either. But anyway, yeah. So, just to like, the way that this actually made more sense, what I've read in philosophy, is that if you want a philosophical, if you want to say the majority of people are philosophical zombies at some time in the past, you just tweak the definition of consciousness to not include certain activities that people in the past didn't have. So, some guy has actually written, um, his name's, last name is James, um, a book that argues that the people in the Iliad were. Unconscious, um, and he does this by—I I don't think it's good—but by tweaking the definition of consciousness to to say, "Oh, well, if you have a god appearing to you, that means there's actually some psychological phenomenon that your brain just isn't firing the right way." And so, if all these people have god god appearing to them, 
that means they weren't conscious because my definition of conscious just means that your brain has fire in a specific way. Yeah. So that's the way that it seems to be. So it's, it's just an ad hoc model to say, I mean, the way you would get, and you know, it's ad hoc. I mean, the way you want to get around it is yeah. that God, you know, created a group of special people inside the garden, right? Mm -hmm. So that they, um, and Adam and Eve are the representative. So, I mean, blazing hot take here. 90%, 98% of all arguments about Adam and Eve are blatantly ad hoc. Like, <laughs> They're, they just are like you know, and it's almost it's almost a part of the nature of it. Science can't really rule out two individuals doing things in the distant past. Uh, what it can do is you know sort of inscribe some limits. So there's like an infinite number of scenarios you can come, can come up with to sort of squeeze them in the cracks of wherever you're committed to. Uh, yeah, like stabbing a liquid is what it says here in the in the chat. It's exactly right. Um, uh, so yes, I think it is blatantly ad hoc. Uh, Oh, sure, yeah, so ad hoc is just saying um, it's, it's to this is literally what it means. And what it, what it means is when you have a hypothesis and there's evidence that seems contrary to it, you redefine the hypothesis so that it incorporates the new evidence. Um, so it's the opposite of predictive. Rather than predicting new occurrences, it's retrospective. Um, a, a, one way I heard exp uh, this explained is if you look up in the stars, there are no constellations. There's an infinite number of constellations. You can draw the dots any way you want. There's no right way or wrong way. Um, and you can just keep adding more dots to them. Likewise, uh, like with, uh, with, with Craig's view, for example, there's literally nothing, nothing in Christian theology that predicts Adam and Eve existed 750,000 years ago. He's created this theory so that it incorporates all the different pieces of evidence. Um, and that's how it is with Adam and Eve, I think, that most of these constructions are sort of, they're, they're sort of ad hoc. They're like, well, here's our starting assumption. Now let's incorporate all the evidence as best we can. Um, so, yes, I, I do think it's, it's, it's uh, largely ad hoc. Is that going to be a symptom of any historical or literary reasoning? Um, it's a symptom of anything where you're committed to, if you're committed to a certain, a certain thesis, uh, then yeah. So, okay, I mean, scientists do this all the time. It's not like it's just theologians that do this. Uh, scientists do this all the time. They start, you know, whenever you have a particular pet theory you, and you have data that contradicts it, you redefine the theory, tweak the edges so that that data is no longer that frightening. Now, interesting book on this, uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions by uh, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, if you keep doing that enough, eventually your theory is going to fall apart and you have to make a new theory. This was exactly what happened in the Copernican Revolution to use another astronomy example. More and more pieces of motion were not able to be you know, harmonized with the reigning theory, so they threw it out and then built a new one uh, from the ground up. Um, so I did have one other comment on the, the people dying before the fall and all that. So my personal hypothesis, this is literally me spitballing, the one version that I have heard that's mildly persuasive is if you take that sequential view Genesis 1 is an in mass creation of human beings, and Genesis 2 is a separate thing altogether. This dovetails nicely with Ben's uh, comment earlier. Human beings were told to fill the earth and subdue it. That's sexual reproduction and presumably hunting vicious beasts that are all over the planet uh, and doing very dangerous things. To subdue the planet is not an easy task. So built in with that uh, claim is that people are going to die and they're going to have to reproduce in order to replace the ones that are missing. Um, so if you just take Genesis 1 by itself and completely chop it in half, truncate it uh, away from Genesis 2, and say God created a mass of human beings that then went out and started hunting and killing and you know, agriculturally and reproducing everywhere, that might work. And then God says, now we're going to elevate things by bringing Adam and Eve into the picture. That could probably work, again, to use our new word. Blatantly ad hoc, like those people would be forerunners yeah. for the sake of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. so that Adam and Eve kind of had footholds. Yeah, because you say they do have the image of God. Because well, did I in Genesis one when he yeah, says, yeah, yeah, and made them in in His image. Yeah, so but they just didn't uh, fall. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So so Adam. So here's the thing. 
Craig's definition of the image of God is only one tiny sliver of like a thousand views that are out there. There's, um, I can't remember the name of the paper, but basically the image of God is really just you're called to do God's function, whatever it is. Um, that's the functionalist view as opposed to the structuralist view, which is what Craig adheres to. And as long as you have certain functions, in, in other words, it's the, the functions are the, the precursor to the image, not the other way around. It's um, if you have the image of God, then you have those structures, but not if you have those structures, then you have those functions. If God calls people to hunt and kill and subdue the earth, you're going to need certain structures to be able to do that, um, for example. Uh, and so they would be in the image of God, because, but it doesn't adhere to this image of God is inherited from Adam and Eve uh, view. Um, there are interesting speculations on whether aliens, hypothetical extraterrestrials, would be in the image of God um, based off of this similar reasoning. So it, it, gets, it gets bonkers. But yeah, but these people were not given the gift of you know, eternal life or anything like that. Yes? Probably also helpful to add the distinction that in some way we mean, we can say all creation is in the image of God, and there's a different sense in which we mean it for specifically Adam and Eve, because mm -hmm. all being comes from God, and that which has being is therefore a part of God's image. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, separate, what we mean for Adam and Eve and what we mean for all creation. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the debate over the image of God is dramatically complicated. Because here's the other thing, too. Like, Craig, for example, he's like, oh, yeah, you have to have all these structures. You've got to have brain capacity. You've got all this to be in the image of God. All you have to do is just say, okay, fine. So fetuses, not in the image of God. They have a zero brain capacity. Or, like, they have a single, like, milliliter of a brain. So they're not in the image of God, right? Of course, Craig doesn't believe that. So what does he do? Oh, my goodness. It's such nonsensical, like, backwards, gymnastic, ad hoc reasoning to get around this. Just admit the image of God's not structuralist. You don't have to. Anyway, I'm putting too many of my cards on the table. Sorry. Um, what was, I had one other, uh, one other comment. Oh, the last comment I had on this, which was this idea of an in mass creation and, and all that. Consider, for example, or just consider this thought. The command of God in Genesis 1 is to subdue the earth, uh, like be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and fill it with your progeny. It seems a bit odd to suggest that Adam and Eve do that all by themselves, just the two of them. Like, think about it. Just two people are going to take over the whole planet. All it takes is one kid, and then Adam gets stomped by a mastodon, and then boom, the project's over, right? So it seems to me that, that that's actually one argument kind of, uh, you know, sort of, it's very you know, small, but it kind of suggests maybe that there's something more going on with this Genesis 1 narrative than uh, what's going on in Genesis 2. But Okay, uh, 9.15. I'll be glad to stick around and talk uh, as long as y'all want, but it um, seems like we're getting over time, so I'll do that. If you're interested in the book, we have, I think, five copies. Uh, they're at the very back. Just race. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.